so thank you everyone for joining uh, and thank you for uh, accommodating this situation. Uh, as I mentioned, like I'm still not feeling too great. Uh, it's not Corona, but it's uh, in general, like uh, my health is not uh, too, been too great in the past week or so. Um, so I'm really happy to be able to give this talk virtually, if anything. Um, so yeah, my name is Filip Babich and I'll be talking about advanced Jetpack Compose features. Uh, or actually how to apply Compose, some of the more advanced stuff in Compose in real world use cases. Uh, and I'll show how you can use some of the best practices to optimize your code, to make it more performant uh, and in general, more readable. Um, so yeah, if you want to know a bit about me, I'm the Jetpack Compose lead at Stream. Um, you can also find me on Twitter or GitHub. I don't generally do a lot of social media. Um, and I, uh, even though I do like a lot of uh, community engagement, so public speaking engagement, writing content, books, stuff like that, I do a lot of things, but I generally don't really use social media. So if you want to reach out to me, it's best to do so via Twitter or on GitHub. Um, if you want to know a bit more about Steam, so uh, in generally, we're a service that provides uh, multiple different types of uh, SDKs. Uh, so we provide a chat SDK, which is something that I'm working on. Uh, and a lot of this information from, from the talk will be kind of from there. Um, and we provide a lot of different clients for the backend and also for the front-end side. So we pretty much support every single platform. And the idea for us is to essentially meet the users where they are. So we want to provide like very easy uh, APIs to consume, something that's very customizable and in general just works a lot uh, for, uh, for our customers. And because of this, Compose is a really, really good match for our SDK. So uh, this is why I'm really excited to talk about advanced Jetpack Compose stuff. But I do have to say that advanced can be very subjective. So for some people, advanced might be just you know building more complex components, more complex UI. So for other people, it might be diving deep into how Compose internals works um, or in general, how the compiler works and all that. Um, for me, it's mostly going to be about these things, um, at least in this presentation. So I'll talk about how you can use state to represent different types of screen, uh, screen UI and screen, screen components. Um, I'll also talk about how you can hook Compose up with MVVM or more like a reactive structure uh, and architecture. So things like state, uh, inform Compose, live data or flow, things like that. I'll talk a bit about generics and combining Compose with uh, Kotlin generics and then producing really useful reusable UI. And also I'll mention a bit about how you can use the transition API to produce really, really nice animations. Um, so when we talk about state-based screens, uh, this is something that is really, really important in Compose. So as we know in Compose, uh, the UI is actually a representation of state. So most people say that it's a function of state. Basically, whatever UI you show has to be declared based on the state that you have. So this is something that's really uh, tricky at the start, really like um, it's, it might be not as intuitive if you're coming from the imperative side of things, such as XML, uh, but it's really good once you start using Compose. Um, this essentially means that you can use things like conditions through if and else statements and when statements to change what is represented on the screen uh, at that given moment based on your state. So if you were to have a composable function that is called my composable and it has some state, that state can be two types. Uh, it can either be like a positive type of state. Uh, this can be like an is check as well or something like that. Uh, or it can have a negative type of state and it can have some error or some, some other value. Uh, so essentially what's happening here is that we are checking what type of state we have. And based on that state, we can show different type of UI. So for example, for the positive state, we might show a list of items. We might show um, some user input, some user form or user information. If you have the negative state, for example, we didn't manage to fetch the information from the server due to a server error, we can show an error view. So this is essentially what Compose does. So you give it some state, you give it some conditions and it shows different, type of, different types of UI. Um, alternatively, if we had something like this, so we can have like a box uh, component that allows us to render multiple types of components um, on top of each other. So you can overlay things. Uh, you can have some base content such as a list, some for content, some user information, something like that. You can have an if check with some condition to give off a dialogue. So basically if the, oh, basically if the uh, condition is met here, you're going to show a dialogue on top of the content. This is very, like when you're coming from XML, this can be really weird because you're looking at this code and there's just an if check, there's no else check, like how does this work? 
But essentially what happens in Compose is unless a function is called <clears throat> in a composable function, it's not going to be rendered on the UI. So here okay. we're going to show the base content at all times. And only if we meet a certain condition, we're going to show a dialog, which is pretty much what you want in UI in general. Another example of how you can have state-based screens is through navigation. So you can have a main screen that has the current screen um, seal class parameter based on the current screen value or type. In this case, we can show the home screen, the profile screen, or the setting screen. So if you're thinking about like showing different types of fragments or different types of UI based on which tab the user selected, this is more or less all the code that you need to provide in Compose. Just make a small when check based on the types, and that's pretty much it. You can just update the type. So let's take a look at a more concrete example. So I have this. <clears throat> so I have this uh, sample project that I worked on in one of my uh, previous uh, content creation engagements, which is uh, called Librarian. So it's a small application that stores books, uh, stores reading lists, and things like that. You can also review books, so you can know if you liked a book or not. Similar to what Goodreads does, I guess. Um, and we have the reading list content wrapper uh, composable function here. So it essentially shows all the content on the reading list page. Here we have a box, which is uh, a way to, again, overlay our components. It's going to fill up the entire screen space. And we have a list of reading lists within this box. What's really important here is that once we tap on a uh, long tap on an item, we're going to update the view model state by uh, passing in the, the reading list that we long tapped, and then we can update the state to say, say put in the reading list uh, locally as a property. And if that delete list or that uh, reading list that we selected is not null, we can show a delete dialog. So this is actually like how it works. So when you update the state, the UI component, the UI definition takes a look at your conditions, takes a look at the state, and based on that state, it's going to show or hide the dialog. So in this case, we long tap on an item. We can update the delete list to be not null, to be the list that we collected. And we can just show a delete dialog, which is really, really cool. Um, we can also do some other things. We can uh, basically put in as many conditions as we want here. So we can have a, a condition to delete a list. We can also have a condition to add a list. We can have a condition to archive a list, to make it a favorite and stuff like that. So based on the number of conditions or the number of UI states that you have, uh, you can show everything in a singular place um, instead of having to, you know, call different functions that create some dialogue wrappers that or fragment dialogues that show them in the UI uh, based on a manager or something like that. All can be shown within a single component in a singular place, which is really, really cool. So in this case, for example, if we tap on a button to add a reading list, um, we can change the flag is showing add list to true, and we can show our add reading list dialogue. And again, this can be completely custom UI because that's kind of what Compose does. It's not just basic uh, basic UI. So how do, do these state changes actually work? What happens underneath? And how can we observe these changes and know what's going on? So state handling in Co Compose is uh, generally connected to something called recomposition. So whenever you change the state of different uh, components in your, uh, in your UI, the UI recognizes which kinds of changes it needs to apply. So Basically, it creates snapshots of the previous values and the current values. And based on those two values, it knows if it needs to, let's say, show a new dialog or if it needs to know, uh, you know about new items being added, removed, or something like that. So this entire process is called recomposition. And it's very smart. It's very optimized. So you don't have to do um, anything about it. And you're still getting all that diff util logic, essentially. So if we were to present something here, um, as an application. So if we, we had like a container state uh, fun uh, composable function, uh, sorry, the container uh, composable function and its uh, corresponding state, the same for the header and the list. So we will have some uh, composable functions and some state. In case we want to change something, for example, adjust the list here, we leave the container, we leave the header, but we change the list, we remove two items. What happens is that the container and the header won't redraw essentially. The list is going to notice that there are differences in its data set, in its state, and it's going to recompose, um, removing those two items from, from the list and from the visual uh, side of things, which is really cool. So essentially, if you don't update any kind of state within uh, your components, you don't have to worry that your entire view hierarchy is going to redraw. The only thing that it is going to redraw is actually the, uh, the 
function that was affected by the state change. So in this case, if we have the you know default uh, UI that we've seen before, and we don't have a dialog because the dialog state is null, as soon as we change the dialog state to be not null based on our condition, we can show a new UI component. In this case, a dialog. So it can be an input dialog for our new reading list, or it can be a delete dialog for the select selected reading list. So how does this all entail and how does this connect to MVVM, to MVI, something like that? So, so more reactive structures and reactive state in general. Well, because Compose is based on declarative programming, this means that everything has to be defined ahead of time. So unlike uh, in imperative programming, such as you know using an MVP example um, in the view toolkit, you don't set listeners to the views or composables in this case. You don't set the state, you don't fetch the state from them, you don't. You can't really access them because they're all functions. Um, and being declarative means that you can easily connect all of this to reactive data flows, which are declarative too. So you usually declare a small reactive property or a small reactive wrapper or something like that, and you define ways in which it can be updated. So as soon as you update them, you can reflect those changes on the rest of your code base. So the best or like the, the easiest way to do this is connecting Compose to view models to observe either the state wrapper from Compose, the live data uh, from wrapper from uh, the lifecycle or in general Jetpack set of tools, uh, flows uh, from coroutines or even Rx if you're you know still using Rx. So any, any kind of reactive state wrapper is going to work and how you get the data to those wrappers is your choice. So you don't have, you're not constrained by anything. The only thing that you need to do is connect Compose to these wrappers. So let's take a look at how to do that. So again, in our example of reading lists, we can observe reading lists by collecting the state from the reading list view model, um, so which is highlighted here. So we can choose the reading list state in the view model and you can, we can call collect as state, which is a flow uh, extension function to transform a flow, a in flow, to a, co a compose state. By using the by delegate or like the general delegate from compose, uh, this becomes a small property we can which we can easily access and we don't have to call state.value or anything like that. Um, in other two examples, is show adding reading list, uh, add reading list and reading list to delete. We have compose state by default and we can observe that by default. So we don't even have to um, you know, fetch or collect it or, or observe it in any way, it's automatically injected in the Compose tree. So what's happening here actually is that we have a view essentially, or the view layer uh, more, more correctly, which is the comp set, Compose set of functions. The view or the, the Compose set of functions, the user uh, tells tells them how to observe the data based on the state wrappers, I mean, the state, state wrappers in our view model. Um, and whenever the state wrapper receives any kinds of updates from, let's say, the repository, from the API, if we have our database, or maybe even like user interactions, uh, the state wrapper notifies the view layer of any changes and it essentially recomposes. So uh, what recomposition is, it takes the current UI layer or the current view layer, it recomposes with the new state, updates it itself, makes appropriate changes, and then you can keep listening to the state wrapper for new changes. So again, now you have a, an updated UI layer, and uh, in case anything is still, again, changed, it's going to push new updates, and it's going to keep on doing that. So it's really optimized, really, really clear. So in this case, when we have our, uh, let's say, flow of reading list from the database, uh, or we have uh, state wrappers from Compose, uh, again, that we, we can monitor ourselves. So for example, in this case, a flag for the re if we are showing the add reading list dialog or a delete reading list state that holds the current selected, currently selected reading list. We can expose those to our uh, user or to our Compose uh, layer to listen to these states. Uh, again, because we have control of these states and these reactive wrappers, Within our functions, such as on add reading list tapped or on delete reading list, we can just pass in the re re corresponding state and just update the value, and that's it. So as soon as something changes in the view model, as soon as we call a, sp a specific function, everything is going to update and everything is going to reflect on the UI. So in this case, for example, when we are trying to add a new reading list, we can just update the repository by calling add reading list. 
Uh, we can also dismiss a uh, dialog such as like resetting the, the issuing ad, ad reading list state to false and also the delete reading list state to null. So what happens here is that we're adding something to the database because we are observing room, we get the automatic update from the database. And finally, we update our local states for the dialog so that we can remove all the dialogues, which is going to be really simple. So as soon as we like update the, the flow in the database, we get a new update, everything recomposes and everything works out of the box. So it's really simple, really clean and really easy to think about. So now that you have an idea of what uh, in general, like the state flow is, where do you hold the state? So as I mentioned, the easiest way is to do it in a view model because it Essentially, it uh, keeps the state persisted across configuration changes. It has a, like a really smart life cycle. It allows you to control um, stuff like uh, coroutines. So to me, that's like a really good option. Another option could be if you don't want to use view models uh, specifically, if you don't want to you know, build something uh, that's tied to another set of tools, if you want to build something yourself, you can always store the data in a database and then use it as a single source of truth. So you can keep observing stuff from the database whenever you make an API call, whenever the user creates some input or something like that, you just insert and inject the data into the database and everything updates correctly. So this is a really nice, really easy way to do things uh, where you don't generally need to do any kind of work because you're already observing a single you know, reactive source of truth. So now that we've gone through that, let's uh, take a look at how we can Take the same approach, which is being state driven, and use that to build complex animations and transitions. Um, so, in this case, uh, we are going to talk about the transition API specifically, uh, not smaller animations such as like animating state. Um, because I, I feel like those are like super simple, and just showing a single line of code doesn't really make sense. Uh, so, uh, complex transitions are, again, like they sound like something that you're going to have to do a lot of work for, but they're actually su super simple in Compose. You can build a base transition, some target values, such as like animation started, animation uh, pause, or animation finished, or something like that, or animation, animation being reversed. And based on the transition state, you can update your components, and everything is, again, going to update accordingly. Um, so here we have the book review detail screen state. We have two objects, two types of it. Uh, so we're going to an animate the book review detail screen. Um, and it's going to have like an initial and a loaded state. So the initial state is when we just open the screen, nothing is happening. And when we have the loaded state, um, <clears throat> excuse me, when we have the loaded state, it's going to fully animate or it's going to be like when the animation has finished. So first we define the states of our elements. Um, this can also be really useful for buttons. So for things like press state, focus state, default state, and so on and so forth. Now, once we have all of these states uh, for the animation animation type, let's say, uh, we can define the actual transition state, like the, the values that we want to animate. So in this case, for the book review details transition state class, we define uh, five different properties. So we're going to animate the margin top uh, the margin top for the image which is a property on the actual image. We're going to animate the margins for the title and the content, again, the top uh, margins. We're going to animate the floating button size and the entire content alpha, so all of the text and everything, uh, how visible or invisible it is. Uh, but default is all going to be, uh, is all going to have some default values, but we can always define what uh, those values are for the specific state. So. First, we create a composable function that returns this animation. So we're going to call it animate book to review details. We pass in the given screen state and we create an update transition for, for this screen state. So we create uh, a transition that's going to target this value of the book review details. So it's going to be in either the initial or the loaded state. And we're going to re return some state that we create later on. Uh, to define the actual transitions or the actual animations, we can use the animate x function. So animate dp, animate float, and stuff like that. Um, we can pass in a transition spec. So the transition spec is essentially the specification of the transition. So how it's going to look. Uh, here we use a nice small tween animation that's going to uh, add some bounciness to the animation. And it's going to be a second long. <clears throat> 
And also we create the target value for the image margin top. So if the target is currently uh, going to be loaded, so <clears throat> the finished state, the image margin top is going to be 16 dp. If it's not, if it's the initial loading state, it's going to be 125 dp. So essentially we're going to animate that the image margin top is going to shrink and the content is going to fly into the screen. Uh, we do the same for other uh, other values such as the floating button size. So we're going to animate from zero dp, so the floating action button not being visible to it being completely visible. Uh, we're also going to animate from uh, for the margin uh, of the title and the content to be like very big margins towards smaller, more reasonable margins. And the content is going to come in from 30% uh, visibility to 100%. Now that we have all of these transitions defined, we can remember and collect the state for that um, transition. And we can apply it based on the animation value. So here we just say uh, the image margin top value of the state is going to be equal to uh, one of these properties. So essentially either the floating button size, title margin, and so on and so forth. So it's going to take the animated values and put it into the transition wrapper so that we can ship the entire object to our components and essentially apply any changes to them. So what happens here is the following. So we have some state in the view model uh, that represents in which state of the animation we are. Are we initially loading the content or are we finished with the, with the loading? Uh, once we change that target state, uh, we can animate and keep an, uh, running the animation and keep updating the values. And we can create a state object that we can observe. So whenever something changes in the state object, we update the UI elements, which are uh, observing the animation. After the animation ends, we can again send the uh, animation or the uh, state change from our UI elements to the view model, and then we can update and move to other uh, other types of uh, UI. So this is something that's really cool, really easy to implement. Uh, it doesn't really take a, a lot of uh, like time or something like that, but the logic is here, and this is essentially the, the life cycle of it. So we just create some observable state, <clears throat> update the state within our view model, and then it reflects it on the UI elements. Um, to actually apply it uh, to UI elements, here we observe the state from the view model. So if we are in the initial or loaded state, and I'm sorry, sorry that I'm saying state so much, but that's literally what, what Compose is. It's everything about state, so it's very common to say that. Uh, so we create the animate, uh, we call the animate book, book review details function. We create the actual state for the animation. We call a launch block here so that after the component is first rendered, we say, okay, view model, we've, we're here in the first load. Now you need to update the animation state and we can run the animation. Um, and we can pass the state around. We can do things like um, put a spacer between our components and put the margin top. We can put in the content alpha, content margin top, and stuff like that. And in this particular example, and I'm sorry that I like couldn't fit it on the screen or anything like that because um, unfortunately my, my PC is kind of uh, lagging all, all that. Uh, I'll send some resources on how it actually looks. What happens is that the entire content of the screen just like uh, slides in and everything fa fades in really nicely. And all of this is done just by you know a few few couple of uh, you know lines of code or something like that. It's really easy. It's uh, it's very performant. It's very easy to build. It's very intuitive. Just create a couple of state wrappers and apply it to to your components. Uh, as and as I mentioned, I I, uh, I have a resource link where you can actually like observe the entire animation and you can see how the entire animation was created and uh, applied to the to the project. Uh, so in terms of uh, some more advanced things that you can do with Compose, you can always build uh, or you can use Kotlin features in Compose because Compose is fully Kotlin. So it's powered by the Kotlin compiler uh, and it has really nice uh, integration with generics, for example. Uh, I really like to use generics because they allow you to re completely reuse components. So if you think about a component like a rating bar, um, it is reusable. You can reuse it on like multiple uh, uh, types of screens for pretty much the same behavior. But you can completely generify components in Compose, such as like dialogues, prompts, menus, and so on, uh, to be reused in multiple types of application, multiple different types of uh, UI, and you can also replace specific aspects of these uh, of these functions. So, for example, here I have a small generic function, which is called delete dialog. It receives an item, and what happens when you want to delete this item? 
Uh, it also received like a message to show in the in the dialog and what happens when you want to uh, dismiss the dialog. Within the actual dialog, we use alert dialog, uh, which is a composable function. We show a small button which essentially triggers the action to delete the item uh, based on the given current item, which is really cool because now we can use this dialog. We can use this generic type of dialog uh, to delete items such as books, but we can also delete reading lists, we can also delete uh, book reviews and so on and so forth. So uh, with just this like small definition of a composable function, which is also generic, we can easily build multiple types of components uh, that kind of do the same thing, but can be applied for multiple different types of things um, in a very abstract and very generic way. Um, another thing that you can do here is you can essentially re replace this content with like custom slot APIs to make it even more usable and even more composable. Another example for this is having uh, spinner pickers or something like that, so uh, drop down menus. So essentially you can give it, uh, you can create a, a generic function, which is a spinner picker, <coughs> sorry, which has some picker text. It has a pre-selected item. Uh, it has a list of items that you can show within the list. Uh, and it has two functions that uh, transform this, these items. So one function transforms each item to a name, to a string to show in the drop down menu. And another function shows um, or connects the behavior when you tap on an item and you select it. So what happens here is that we have some state in the uh, picker. So if we're uh, if we've expanded the picker or not, we also show if um, what the currently picked item is in terms of text, so that the user can see the current option. We can show a drop down menu, which has a toggle. Uh, and essentially has some like uh, you know default modifier values for the size and all that. But what's really important is that by using generics again and using like an iterative pattern here, you can list items here <clears throat> that are showing different types of generic items. And each of these items shows like a small text and can be clicked to select it in a drop down menu, which is really simple, really cool, really easy to build. And you can do all of this yourself in like you know five, 10 minutes, something like that. It's like really, really simple. Um, and we can use this spinner picker in a very nice and easy way. We just pass in the genres, for example, here for creating uh, new book entries. Uh, and the user can pick from these selected genres. They can uh, choose something. Uh, but this picker can also be used to select books, to select um, when you want to review them, to select reading lists if you want to expand or connect your data and stuff like that. So you can really combine these generic components that have like a very similar UI into multiple different types of screens, um, not really like based on the type of state that you have. It can be different types of items, which is really, really cool. So before we wrap up, uh, there's a lot of information around here and there's a lot of new things that you can obviously do in Compose yourself. So um, one of the things that you're probably looking for are resources on how you can uh, build these components yourself, how you can like build composable uh, functions yourself, how you can build composable APIs. Um, so in general, what I would definitely like to suggest here is our Jetpack Compose by Tutorial book. So we have a really nice book here at Remo.com um, that uh, outlines a lot of different types of Compose UI, has a lot of tutorials, a lot of examples uh, built in. Uh, so if you're looking for like Compose fundamentals, but also like internals of how Compose works, you can definitely check out our book. Uh, this is like an older screenshot. The book is kind of uh, up to date, more up to date now. Uh, and we're working on a new update. Uh, in terms of uh, the Compose side of, uh, or the Compose SDK side of things here at Stream, if you want to check out our SDK again uh, to build uh, really cool chat applications that have like completely, uh, completely customizable components and default behavior if you want, um, you can check out our uh, SDK repo, which is completely open source. So even the, the project management uh, is open source. You can check out our tutorial SDK docs and you can create a free account, uh, which is really cool. So if you have a very small um, application or something like that, uh, you can use this application basically for free, uh, which is really, really cool. And you can uh, reach out to us if you do test out our uh, repo and uh, give it a try, you can reach out, uh, out to us on Twitter. Uh, in terms of actual Compose, uh, if you're looking for more resources, what I would highly recommend is the Jetman Compose API guidelines. Uh, set of guidelines from uh, Google. This is a really, really good document, really nice that 
uh, outlines everything about Jetpack Compose uh, that you might need in, when you're building your own APIs or applications. Uh, so you can use that. I would highly recommend this. It, it's a bit of a longer read, like a couple of hours, but it's very, very worth it. Um, and if you're not uh, like looking, if you're looking for like more uh, hands-on approach uh, examples, then definitely check out uh, Google Code Labs, which are also really, really good. And finally, our book, uh, if you're uh, looking for like more examples and more hands-on things. So with that being said, uh, thank you for listening. I hope I managed to cover some of the more advanced things in Compose, like how state management works, how you can connect it to your components, your UI, how you can build transitions in, in, uh, in that regard, and also how you can provide a really uh, useful, really uh, generic component. So uh, I would definitely like to thank you for this, uh, for this opportunity, especially to, to speak remotely, because uh, I'm like not like feeling too great overall. Uh, but uh, before we go again, I definitely want to ask, uh, are there any questions and uh, is there anything that I can add or answer that I didn't get around to in the presentation? Thank you very much. So are there any questions for Philip? Go ahead. Okay, Philip, you were perfectly clear. Okay. <laughs> thank you um, very much. Yeah, so I just want to say <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, uh, so I definitely want to say uh, if you do have more questions, Compose is like a very, very broad topic. There's a lot of things in Compose that are new that you need to explore that you can apply in your applications. So if you do have any more questions after obviously this event or something that you come up with in your personal projects, do not do not hesitate to reach out to me. I'll do my best to, to help you out based on my experience. Uh, I've been using Compose for, for a bit more than a year now. So uh, I, I like to say that, that, that I know, know a few things here and there. So I can definitely like try and help you out if you have any kind, kinds of questions. But if not, again, thank you for the presentation. Oh, yeah. A question. Like on the Swift UI side, when you put generics, then it makes it harder for Swift UI to then optimize and to provide the proper rendering. Is there some kind of performance topic and some kind of performance uh, drawback <coughs> using generics on Jetpack Compose? No. Oh. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. So the way that Swift UI uh, works in general and like how it renders components is that it, it uses uh, objects and uh, it's like more object oriented. So uh, it needs to know the type of uh, of its components to render the UI properly. So in case you have generics, then uh, you can like conform to these generic types and have like more redundancy in the code to make it work. In terms of Compose, the way that it renders the UI is completely based on the state. So if you have the same generic function, and well, if you have a generic function, but you pass in the same state, the snapshots are going to be the same. And in that sense, there's not going to be any performance impact. So essentially, because everything is uh, function driven and you don't have object, you, you don't have like references, you don't have uh, you know memory addresses or anything like that, that are based on these generics or, or types. Um, because of all this, the actual UI code that is being rendered and everything that is being shown is powered by the same state. And in that sense, it's going, the comparisons are going to be equal. So you have a same generic component uh, that you, let's say, call twice, uh, or like the state doesn't change. It's not going to redraw because the state is still the same. The snapshot is the same. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you again for agreeing to do this and thank you everyone bye thank you so much and i'll see you around i guess bye